there is a fight for the soul of Islam happening right Why now. Why is the Muslim world stuck? Because we ought to believe in progress. Are there are our problems. Is Islam compatible with modern development? Well, the answer to that kind of depends on who you're asking, but... So currently I am in Istanbul in Turkey and I have to say this place has completely blown me away from the energy of the place, I mean the style of the people and just everything that the city has to offer. And so much so that you almost forget that you're in a Muslim country. I mean 99.8% of people according to some sources are Muslim in this country. And look, I grew up Muslim myself and when I think of a Muslim country, this is not what I think of. So it turns out that this battle between what Islam is and isn't has been happening for a long time all over the world. But it's especially been very, very prominent here in Turkey. On the one corner, you have the Islamist and traditionalist. And on the other, you have the rationalist. They believe in secularism and in science. And who wins this fight not only is going to determine the livelihoods of people here in Turkey, but they're going to determine the livelihoods of people all over the Muslim world. So with that in mind, let's go beyond the facade and try to uncover the relationship that Islam has with rationalism, secularism, and science. four questions that I am interested in exploring in this video and I'm gonna give it a shot and where I can't answer them I'll bring in experts to assist in answering them and so the four questions are one is Islam compatible with modern development Two, what is Turkey's relationship with Islam and secularism three what is the impact of secularism in Turkey and its counter reactions from the traditionalist and four what is the future of islam in turkey and beyond so let's dive into the big question that is is islam compatible with modern development or put another way is islam capable of modern development in order to understand this, I think we first have to go back and understand a little bit about history and specifically about what Islam is. And so I guess the natural question we first should answer is, what is Islam? Islam is an Abrahamic monotheistic religion and it centers around the Quran and the teachings of Muhammad who is seen as the last and final prophet. Muslims see their faith as the final part of all the other earlier prophets such as Adam, Ibrahim, Moses, and Isa, also known as Jesus. Therefore, according to Muslims, Judaism and Christianity are seen as the predecessors of Islam. The Quran is seen as a verbatim final revelation of God. The Quran sets the rights and responsibilities and rules for people and societies to adhere to. Muhammad then provided examples which is recorded in the Hadith books showing people how he practically implemented the rules from the Quran in society. So the combination of the rules that are set in the Quran and the Hadith is what's considered as the Sharia laws. However, after the passing of Muhammad, you run into a bit of a problem. So, in Islam, the Prophet Muhammad, while considered the greatest man to ever live, is still considered a man. He can't live forever. So, after his passing, the question is, how are Muslims supposed to reckon with new ideas, legal matters, or even just innovations, right, that weren't set out in the Quran 
or weren't provided for as an example in the hadith. Because it's not like new ideas and things are just going to stop being discovered after the passing of the Prophet. This is where we have what are called fiqhs. Fiqhs are the human understandings of the practices of the Sharia law. Think of them like interpretations. There are numerous fiqhs in Islam from Hanafi, Maliki, Shafi, Hanbali, Ashari, Maturdi, Atharid, on and on and on. And trying to uncover the difference between each one is complex and will probably take the remainder of this video plus more. But in the spirit of the video, let's focus on the big difference across the different schools. And that is their view on traditionalism versus rationalism in Islam. So traditionalists are often embodied by the Ashari school and they emphasize strict adherence to the literal and apparent meanings of the Quran and the Hadith without any interpretations or philosophical understandings of these things. Right? They're cautious of engaging in speculative theology and they believe that the meaning of the religious texts are cut and clear. Right? Their ideological approach tend to be more conservative and literalist. And so some key characteristics of traditionalists are one, an emphasis on the literal meaning of the Quran and the Hadith. Two, a reliance on direct textual evidence from the Quran. Three, a skepticism for philosophical reasoning in matters of faith. And fourth, a focus on maintaining the simplicity and purity of the faith without any sort of speculation whatsoever. To get a perspective on what the modern take of traditionalists are, I got to chat with a very famous and influential traditionalist. The documentary that I'm working on won't know who you are, so if you could introduce yourself. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. In the name of God, in Islam, we always begin with that. My name is Said Hussein Nasr. I'm an Iranian the Persian, born in Tehran and brought up there. When my father was dying, I was sent to the United States, so I decided to go to MIT. Went to Harvard to also learn the descriptive sciences. I was studying Islamic and Oriental philosophy, and I was a professor at Tehran University for many years, the dean of the faculty of arts and sciences, vice chancellor of Tehran University, and president of Iran's Royal University, our American University. In 1970, and I founded the Iran Academy of Philosophy, the Royal Academy. Then by the revolution in 1979, because of the high positions they had in Iran, I had to leave the country, and I've been in exile since then. Well, first of all, the of philosophy, as we understand it, people like myself, or traditionalists, uh, refers to the wisdom that God had given to mankind since the creation of man. Muslims believe that uh, God revealed uh, wisdom, which is perennial and universal. Now we know the basics of traditionalism, let's turn to rationalism. And on the other end, we have the rationalists, which are best represented by the Mutazilites. The Mutazilites believe that reason and logic are tools that can be employed to interpret the Quran and the Hadith and extract deeper meanings from them. And they held a few key beliefs. One, the Mutazilites rejected the literal interpretations of the Quran and emphasized a allegorical and metaphorical interpretations. Two, they strongly believed in human free will and therefore moral responsibility. They held that humans are capable of choosing between good and evil and they should be accountable for their choices here in this world. And three, they held the view that the Quran was created by a God at a certain point in time, as opposed to the traditional belief that the Quran is eternal. And lastly, the key and central point of the Mutazilite belief is the promotion of rationalism and the use of reason in theological matters. They believe that reason should be the ultimate criterion for determining matters of faith and ethics and that religious teachings should align with rational principles. And to get a better grasp of what Islamic rationalists sound like today, I had the opportunity to chat with Dr. Pervez Hoodboy. 
It's going well, thank you. That is amazing. Thank you so much for meeting with me. One of my uh, interests has been to answer the question, why is the Muslim world stuck? It's been in, uh, in the doldrums for the last 800, 900 years with no innovation, no research, not much to show. Talk a lot about this in your book and your lectures, about this notion of cause and effect. What does it mean to you and how does it ultimately relate to objectivity, rationality, or even science itself? Well, relating cause to effect is fundamental to science. It's the belief that we can disentangle the universe, that we can find behind every single thing that happens a cause. If we assume that the world is run by physical law, that means that everything that happens ultimately has a cause. Now that cause is something that in principle we can find, but in practice may be very difficult. So if there is a disease that mysteriously starts, there are two different attitudes that one could take towards it. One, that this is divine retribution for your crime. So this is what was said about AIDS and later about COVID-19 as well. And in that case, um, then atonement became, becomes the way of dealing with it. Mm. And basically, one, one is told that these are things beyond one's control. And so, um, submit to it and uh, do what you can. And uh, if you don't make it, well, anyway, uh, you'll go to heaven if you do the right things. Mm. The other attitude is, that, uh, yeah, we don't know exactly what is causing this disease, but uh, we'll find out. Mm -hmm. And so, every disease has therefore been tracked down to either bacteria or to fungus or to viruses. And even after you find out what's responsible for it, you don't necessarily have a means for dealing with it, but uh, it so it turned out that with AIDS we could, a cocktail of drugs that uh, suppress that virus, make it more and more difficult for it to spread. And uh, similarly, the vaccine that was discovered for COVID-19. Now that's at the medical level, but it's exactly the same thing when you look into the skies and you ask, um, hey, what's causing the planets to move in this particular way? Can we say something other than uh, they're just there? And of course, that was the beginning of, uh, of uh, astrophysics, starting with Newton. And whatever we see in the sky, it could be a shooting star, it could be something that explodes out there, um, well, why did it happen? We look for causes. Now that we know a little bit about Islam and the ideological you know, battles between traditionalism and rationalism, let's get into how this actually unfolded historically. Okay, let's teleport ourselves to the early 9th century, to Baghdad of the Abbasid Empire, the same Baghdad that is now the capital of Iraq. Obviously, this is an Islamic empire. However, Baghdad then was not what it is today. Believe it or not, it was the center of the scientific world. While Europe was going through its dark ages, scholars and scientists from all over the world flocked to Baghdad. And this scientific freedom and curiosity was not an accident. In Baghdad at the time, it was championed by the Caliph, al mamun who was a devout Mutazilite. He was an intellectual and he aimed to make Baghdad, and therefore like the Muslim empire at the time, the center of science. His efforts paid off greatly. He created what is famously known as the House 
of Wisdom, which was a famous library and intellectual center. And scholars from the House of Wisdom are credited in the creation of algebra, advancements in chemistry and finance, amongst many other innovation. And Al-Mamun was a Mutazilite, and he was a devout one. He took extreme measures to preserve the Mutazilite tradition, and he went as far as imprisoning some very famous Asherites. The extreme rationalistic attitude of the Mutazilite was followed by a powerful counter-reaction from the Orthodox Muslims in Baghdad. And this reaction was greatly aggravated by the attempts of Al-Mumun to basically force Mutazilam and rationalism on the people. The traditionalist Muslims adhered strictly to the literal interpretations of the Quran and the Hadith, and so they refused to admit any of the innovations that the Mutazilites and Al-Mumun was taking part in, and they had a great deal of displeasure from this. This reactionary progression was best captured by Abu Hassan al-Ashari, the founder of the Ashrite school. You see, Ashari was actually a Mutazilite for most of his life, up until the age of 40 years old. However, he wound up unsatisfied with the rationalistic Mutazilite project. One day, Ashari had a dream where he claimed that he saw the Prophet Muhammad and that the Prophet told him to hold fast to the Quran and the Hadith. So after he woke up, he repented for promoting the Mutazilite beliefs and went on the offense to abolish the Mutazilite project. Now, Ashari believed that the revelations from the Quran is the only source of the ultimate truth and that reality and reason should only be used insofar as to confirm those revelations. And Ashari theology was so popular that it practically became the theology of the Muslim community across the world and has continued to remain so up to the present time. And it was practically etched into the soul of Islam by another theologian by the name of Abu Hamid al-Ghazali. Al-Ghazali had lots to say about the role of science in Islam and he believed that the revelation was the source of all knowledge and that the pursuit of science and worldly progress should not be encouraged at all. In giving advice to a young scholar, Al-Ghazali once told him famously, O oh youth, how many nights you have remained awake, repeating science and poring over books and have denied yourself sleep. I do not know what the purpose of it was. It was attaining the worldly ends and securing its vanities and acquiring its dignities and surpassing your contemporaries and such alike. Woe to you and woe again. You see, these words can seem archaic, but modern philosophers such as Professor Syed Hossein Nasri, who I chatted with for this video, praise Al-Ghazali as the man who saved orthodoxy by depressing science. And with the adoption of the Ashari school, science and rationalism, and therefore secularism, was basically relegated to the back burners in Islamic literature and society. And this is something that haunted Islam and continues to haunt it even 800 years later. Here's what the scholars think about the current state of Islam and science. Islam has not had any or significant breakthroughs in science, say in 800 years. And so to illustrate your perspective on perennial philosophy, could you share, I guess, an example of how Islamic teachings have contributed to progress in the modern world, specifically in the natural world? First of all, I don't believe in progress. Mm -hmm. I think all our problems come from progress. Progress in polluting all the rivers of the world. Uh, so I don't want to use the word progress in that sense. The idea that the civilization's value is judged by its scientific achievement itself is a modern scientific heresy. The, the works that Muslims have written during these last 400 years on spirituality, on philosophy in the real sense, on theology, are much more profound than most of the things that have written in the scientific world. Hmm. 
And the impressive part is that that was said with a straight face. Let's hear from the rationalist now. It's a state of mind which seems to have gripped Muslims. And teaching students over here, at some level, they are, um, well, they all have the same genetic composition as anybody else, but uh, they lack curiosity, they lack um, basic competence in such things as reading, writing, mathematics, and in particular, their reasoning abilities are really are much less developed than you would find in the United States or in Europe. And that's because of the particular nature of Muslim education. Most of them have gone through, well, practically all of them have gone through the education system here in Pakistan, which is heavy on rote memorization and full of um, the idea that all knowledge comes from the Quran, that it's the most perfect book, it's the word of God. And, in, and uh, therefore, from a very young age, we are taught verses, we are taught to memorize verses. And um, that, to my mind, um, makes a big difference in the quality of education between here and outside. Mm -hmm. So anyway, um, I wrote this book which you read, uh, but also in in uh, numerous lectures, in in other efforts to bring rationality to the society where it's in low demand and uh, where it is, uh, it's like trying to force food down somebody's throat. Anything that the Prophet has not done, you cannot do. And if you do it, it's called bidda. That's innovation. Mm. And innovation is not permitted. There was an earthquake in Pakistan in 2005, and 90,000 people died in that. They blamed this onto um, television, because uh, television is haram. It shows living images. And so there was uh, a television destroying ceremony in which television sets were thrown out of the top story of a, uh, of a tall building. Hmm. The cause of earthquakes was watching TV. But there is uh, nothing that uh, that uh, uh, impels you towards the direction of quantitative reasoning in the Quran. So let's zoom back out and remember the question that we're seeking to answer for this section. Is Islam compatible with modern development? Well, the answer to that kind of depends on who you're asking, but has Islam ever been a bastion of scientific progress and development? The answer to that is very clear. Yes, it has been for a period, for a long time actually, but has not been for the greater part of 800 years or so. Now we get into the second question, that is, what is Turkey's relationship with Islam and secularism? You see, the Dark Ages is still going on in Islam, but once in a while there comes a glimmer of hope, and that glimmer of hope is what came out of the Ottoman Empire and today is known as Turkey. It all starts with one man, and his name is Mustafa Kemal. Who is he exactly? Born in 1881 in the Ottoman Empire, Mustafa Kemal Ataturk attended a prestigious military academy, showing promise for a successful military career. During World War I, he led many successful campaigns for the Ottoman Empire alongside the Germans. Despite his military genius, the Ottomans ended up obviously losing the war because they chose the wrong side. After World War I, the Allies dismantled the Ottoman Empire, leading to Greek and Allied attempts to seize 
Ottoman territories. However, the Ottomans resisted fiercely and Ataturk emerged as a charismatic leader rallying the Turkish masses for independence. After years of struggle, the Ottomans gained independence and Mustafa Kemal Ataturk played a pivotal role in founding the modern Turkey, earning him the title of the father of the Turks. Ataturk. Yet, building a modern nation proved very challenging, obviously. As some sought to return to the Ottoman era's Islamic influence, Ataturk aimed to create a forward-looking secular nation. And so, the debate over Islam's compatibility with modern development was at the heart of Ataturk's transformation. And where Ataturk stood on this subject was not a mystery. Ataturk was a highly educated person and any person who takes inventory of the history of Islam and progress up to this point in history will quickly realize that the destitute nature of progress from within the religion for the past 800 years is worrisome. There are but four conclusions I think that one could champion from this realization. First, Islam as such is incompatible with modernity and needs to be discarded at least as the basis for political and public life. Second, Islam could be the basis of a successful society if it was modernized and made compatible with modern demands. Third, Muslims need to restore Islam to the pure form of the early centuries, thereby recreating the condition for its original success, whenever that was. Fourth and lastly, things could stay as they were, which not surprisingly was usually the option preferred by the Islamic clergy. Ataturk came to the first conclusion that for Turkey to transform into a modern nation and achieve progress for the people, it had to abandon Islam as the basis for political and public life and be a secular country. And in place of Islamic rules as set forth by the Quran and the Hadith, Ataturk believed that Turkey should be ruled by rational and scientific thinking, free from traditional revelations of the past. He saw Islam as an impediment to modernization and he sought to get rid of its influence in Turkish political and society. And the first stride on Ataturk's path to secularization was the abolition of the Caliphate, which was the political and Islamic leadership that ruled over Turkey for well over 500 years. This was pivotal uh, as it severed the link between religious authority and governance and paving the way for a secular state. Next, Ataturk borrowed the Swiss civil code, dismantling the religious and legal framework and establishing secular courts. And this shift marked a departure from the Quran and the Hadith, derived Sharia laws and customs, promoting a more rational legal system. Then, Ataturk recognized the power of education in shaping a modern nation. He replaced Islamic schools with secular education systems, promoting scientific learning and modern values. And a cornerstone of Ataturk's reform was the promotion of women's rights and education. He believed that empowering women was crucial for societal progress, fostering equality and new opportunities. Ataturk took up many other reforms, such as replacing Arabic alphabets with Latin alphabets to encourage modern clothing styles and discouraging traditional Islamic clothing, such as the hijab. A secular Turkey utilized the resources of the country and federal income to promote education, healthcare, infrastructure, public security, science, technology, and so forth, instead of being used to encourage religious agendas with no material benefit. History doesn't usually repeat itself, but it sure as hell does rhyme. And rhyme it is. Just like the heydays of the Mutazilites and their success in ushering in the golden age of Islam in Baghdad and beyond, Turkey stood and still stands, although on very shaky ground, as a symbol of modernity and progress, rooted in its staunch commitment to secularism, rationalism, and development under scientific inquiry. Breaking free from the constrictions of history and bringing with it a remarkable advancement in education, women's rights, economic growth, Turkey emerged as a nation determined to walk the path of progress and lived happily ever after. 
Yeah, right, no. A new chapter is unfolding in Turkey, and it's all because of this guy, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, and his Justice and Development Party. Erdogan became Turkey's president in 2002. He has been the de facto ruler for the last 21 years. Erdogan's traditionalist leaning agenda sought to reshape Turkey's course by embracing religious influences in governance and overturning the secularist traditions of Ataturk. Erdogan introduced a blend of religion and politics that sought to overturn the decades of progress and herald a return to a more Ashari sympathetic ideals. Erdogan's leadership bore policies that undermined the secularist fabric of Turkish society. The very foundation of a modern progressive Turkey faced challenges as religious conservatives began to seep into governance. From changes to educational curricula, restrictions on media, and the shifts in public discourse reflected an evolving landscape that contradicted the principles of secularism and rationalism. Today, Turkey finds itself at a crossroad with the battle between secularism and Islamist conservatism simmering beneath the surface. Erdogan won another highly contested election a few months ago in 2023. Many contend that the election was rigged or at the very least influenced in the direction of Erdogan. Nonetheless, Erdogan is still president and he has some rather unorthodox policies that he has implemented. For example, Erdogan, influenced by his Islamic beliefs towards interest, is responsible for one of the most heinous economic disasters in the past decades. I mean, it is just absurd. Decades of economic findings have taught us that when faced with high inflation, the only way to get rid of it is to increase interest rates to discourage spending. However, because interest is forbidden in Islam, not only did Erdogan refuse to increase the interest rate, he continued to decrease it, further making the problem worse. I mean, this is equivalent of alchemy, and this has resulted in millions of people's life savings being completely wiped away. And so Turkey's journey from secularism to being on the brink of ushering in a modern Ashari-like regression serves as a cautionary tale. It reminds us that even the most resilient ideals can falter when tested by competing ideology. This isn't just a story that is unfolding in Turkey. It is happening in every corner of the world, from Pakistan to India to Saudi Arabia and many more in between. In fact, this even goes beyond religion. Any political ideology rooted in dogmatism or revelations is dangerous and should be engaged with on an intellectual level, from ethnicity, nationality, and even racial. And across the globe, Islamic movements have sprang into existence, embodying a response to a sense of frustration within the Muslim world today. The driving force behind this resurgence is complex and has many motives. The traditionalist resurgence in Turkey is among one of the most worrying of these movements that have kicked into gear a regression of progress for Turkey. The proposed remedies of many Islamic movements centers on the embrace of an authentically Islamic path and the renunciation of all things deemed Western, be it Western science, Western rationalism, Western democracy, or even the very idea of progress itself. Ironically, within the Western Muslim communities, a distinct and influential subset live in a Western and secularist world, reaping the benefits of scientific progress basking in the protection of the human rights, savoring the fruits of liberty, and paradoxically utilizing this very freedom to advocate for traditionalist doctrine. These beliefs subtly erode the foundations of secular values upon which their privileges rest. In truth, Islamic society has become disengaged from the realm of rational and scientific discourse, leaving in it a void of 800 years of regression. And rather than returning to traditional paradigms, what beckons is the adoption of an intellectual and progressive-oriented framework, a practical one, one rooted in science and reason. And remember, the choice that we make today will echo throughout generations. And so with that, stay informed, stay engaged, 
and look beyond the facade.